themselves as one. And we found this guy, right? And this can be seen as a projection of X on the linear space found by this vector. And this thing, the difference between the vector, the projection is very zero. So this <coughs> So this is a very important equation. Right? You see that it's very important, for example, when we discuss these squares. So this equation uh, is a way to write any vector as the sum of the vector which is pi, the vectors, and the vector which is very similar, which is orthogonal of them. So we can equate it. which are uh, square matrices which whose columns and rows are orthogonal. Okay. So you, you transpose equal to the head. Okay. You transpose equal to the head. Okay. Sometimes you say the matrix is orthogonal when you put it just the columns of the rows. rows <coughs> Thank you. 
book and following as well. Corresponding equation. This is the vector equation and the matrix equation. Uh, and this is the way it is similar to the eigenvalue decomposition. Right? The difference is that the pi are different from the pi. They may be not matrix plus vector. The general case that you can leave in different dimensions, right? But the matrix is a rectangle. 
So this equation here is what uh, repeats what I said in words. Okay. So you can always uh, find so if the matrix A is rank N, we can find N pairs of vectors. And you are in the are in pairs. And n positive numbers, the similar values, sigma 1 to sigma n. Then we always use the convention that they are ordered in non increasing fashion. Right? We solve this equation. Okay, we solve this equation, in addition, there are orthodoxes, so there are other equations. So this, is, this is the. This, this gives you a similar composition. And then, right? you can write the matrix in this form. Or if you like, you can also write it in vector notation as a sum uh, of j from 1 to n, right? sigma j, and then it will be u j, j factors. So this is the same. <coughs> to be a sophisticated uh, tool because you also push to the top one of the better than it. So, so I think you can see that you went there. Is this clear to you or this is an equation? Reduce SVD, right? Because what you could also do, when you take, you have the UJ and the UJ for one to n, right? And in general, they don't form a basis for the space you have right? Because, so for example, if M is bigger than N, then you have only N of the uh, N of the UJ, right? Add more to make a basis for R. You can do this. So you can complete these two orthonormal sets to basis, and simply you can say that sigma j is equal to zero for j bigger than the rank of the matrix. Here, assume that, and then it gives you a full SVD. But it is the same thing. Just that you add things there so that the matrix U and V, right? right now they are orthogonal, so they are square. <coughs> Transpose. Whereas here, so you have this, this, this is the reduced, right? So the columns are autonomous, but the rows are not. So, uh, typically, you always work with the reduced SVD. You don't need the other side. So, uh, this is the composition also gives you a way to uh, understand how the matrix A acts on a generic vector X domain space. Right. You have X, right. so you put A, you apply to X, and what you do, you project X along the DJ, Always be able to write x as a combination of the j plus the other elements which make the j basis. <coughs> but only the components of the j with sigma j is zero will be important to understand what is the image of this vector. So the image is a real combination of the uj where the coefficients are determined by the projection of sigma. But there are many other properties that Frank described last week. Now I don't go through them, through all of them again, They're associated with the similar value composition. So, for example, it is not the best way, but if you want to know the rank of the matrix, it counts on a similar value difference. <coughs> there, so the rank. If you want to know, Spectral norm, which is an induced matrix 
unknown, it's very important to describe the maximum similar value to that. Number of properties and matrices which are associated with the Example, 
if you want to find a matrix of rank k, right, which is uh, the closest to a according to Frobenius law. This is just Euclidean law. So you have to square the difference of the matrix element of k and k, sum them up, you take the square to the <coughs> Euclidean norm of the matrix. Well, the answer is that you take just the k medium single values and vectors of the matrix A, and that is provides the closest rank K approximation to A. So this is a very important result. And we will see it in full details. I think. <coughs> uh, and this is what principal component analysis is. Okay. Vector v, which is a two dimensional vector in the plane, right? So this matrix v is two times two. Then what you do, or what is an example of projection, is an operation which takes this vector and it brings it down to this line, right? Along some other line, direction, which is this direction. Okay, good. And so, as I mentioned before, if the direction forms an orthogonal angle in the space, so if it was like that, that would be an orthogonal projection. You see the next line. But in general, it doesn't need to be orthogonal. <coughs> okay. So algebraically, what happens is that um, so the projection is P V. This is V. Okay. Then, uh, if you take, uh, so what is the property of projection? Then, if you take, if you subtract from the projection of V, the vector V, this is, this is the null space of the projection. So if you apply again the projection, this vector will take a zero vector. Right? And the reason is that you take P and you multiply by. Is, is, a of it, right? is equal to zero because p squared is equal to b. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, right. Yeah, so 
the projection of this, so I need to follow this line. It looks like it's going to take effect of the projection of those things. That's what's up. Well, it follows from the problem, doesn't it? Because I've assumed that the time speed is equal to it. So that, that's the only We see P as a single vertical position, P squared we have also, and we see that there are some properties uh, about the singular values for the projection. Yes, so some properties which connect P to the complementary projections, complementary properties, in fact, so that's why you call it complementary projections. So the range space of the complementary projection is equal to the null space of the projection. This follows by, by this property. Okay. We should apply P to the complementary vector of the range space again because p squared is equal to p so <coughs> and likewise the range of p is equal to the null space all these things I think will be more uh, clear visually clear from the screen the more the more the top of the So what happens is the range space and the null space don't intersect. Right? So the projection separates the plane into two uh, spaces. That's what it is. And again, this will 
This case is simple, right? Because it is uh, symmetric. <coughs> so I can go to the uh, U, right? And Eggenpectus. And then lambda, U transpose. So lambda is the diagonal matrix of Eggenpectus. Most of the magnitude. And um, the diameter. Here I have already used the fact that this <coughs> yeah. other properties I need to use to understand some more information, to get some more information about the number. Still use the fact that this square is going to be. So I compute this square. Same thing with the similar value composition in C is not symmetric. Very much along the same lines, make some conclusions on similar values. Okay. And I 
comes to the maximum, you know, like a side end. But so I know for sure that what I observed is an amber which is not far from the ground truth, which is W star in front of us. So this case makes sense to try to residual sum of squares, right? So the nice objective function, which is the sum of the square of the difference between the two and the output that you have measured and the, predict the, the, the predicted output for your model, for your function W. So the function is equal to W. Um, I think it is clear what Very natural objective function for the integration problem. We could also decide to use some other function here, the absolute value, for example, or something else. And so the reason for which we put the square is, but one reason is that uh, what I'm going to say is simple. <coughs> I would say the other way, the absolute value is that it would be a more difficult problem. I might minimize it on the double case. Okay. But, but by no means impossible. <coughs> it's where we can discuss probably properties of that problem. Later in the course, we'll discuss a bit about uh, optimization of what, what complex sets are, complex functions, and how to minimize complex functions. So if you put here the absolute value, you still have a conflict of complex optimization problems, so and you can solve the problem. So here, in a way, by putting here the square, you really uh, want to avoid that there are big deviations between your prediction and the group of the square would emphasize that. Whereas if you were going to pick up some value, you would be less, more tolerant for the deviations. It's the difference between the mean and the median. But very simple, you know, it's very, uh, perhaps what is not written here, but just the small digression. The simplest problem that you encounter in this case, so is when uh, x is one dimensional, one dimensional, so when x are one dimensional, and x i's are always equal to one. That's is a simple. I would say, I would argue this is the, the simplest example of this square problem, right? So x i are only equal to one. So then, so this the problem you will have. R of W is equal to that. Okay. And that. You know what the solution of this is, right? What is the number W which minimizes that? I think I heard the correct answer. The mean. The mean, yes. So the mean is the number which stays closest a set of numbers, which are samples of some distribution, according to the square root error right here. What about if you put the absolute value? The median. The median. Yeah. So that's the value you find the median is the, the point which stays close to your, to your data according to the absolute value. And if you do some analysis, this is a diagram. If you say something more than just what you know, which will not be in the exam, so you can do this if you're not interested. It's something for you to think of outside the course. But you, you, can show, you can show, for example, the media speed the data into arms. <coughs> you can put also other functions there. So there is a, a whole branch of statistics which discuss what is a good function there, which is robust to us. So there are many interesting topics. So the way these squares are like the, the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Of many methods in machine learning statistics start from the choice of the loss factors on the square loss. And also 
choice of some constraints. And so often you will not just minimize this, this with the absolute value of something else, but you will minimize this within some set, which somehow makes sense <coughs> to you, right? Or perhaps with the regularization as we described now again today. So then you need to remember some facts that you know if you want to find the minimum of this function, make the, the, the gradient equal to zero. So if you do that, if the, the gradient of the function is set equal to zero, you find some equations. And the beauty of these equations is that since the, the, the square loss, the equations are here, right? So uh, here, if you have not seen this before, just to be very pedantic, but a little bit short, so you need to remember how to differentiate a uh, function of effect as a gradient. Right? So if you have this, and there are different ways to do it. Then you can use matrix or vector notation, but then do it first with uh, the vector notation. I call the vector notation because x and all the quantities in box are in a scalar of the vector. Can you put them in here? Yeah. So, so we want to take the gradient of this. The gradient is the vector which has as component the function derivative of this function of w over the components of w. That's what I call the gradient of r. Right. Right. So you need to remember some some chain rules for gradients and derivatives. So, you to, so, what the, way, so the gradient of the sum of function is the sum of the gradients. So you just compute the gradient of each term under the sum, and then the sum over r. So what is the gradient of this thing? So it's like so it's a vector derivative. So first thing I Two out, right? And I take function. I use the composition. Okay. I'm taking the derivative of this function with respect to this algorithm. Right? It was a scalar function. Yeah, like it was a standard derivative, not a gradient. And then I need to take the gradient of the argument. And the argument is yi, which is a scalar, and it's minus w transpose plus xi, which is a linear function. So that the gradient that linear function is just minus xi. So, so this is the result of the gradient of my function r is this vector, and it should be of the right dimension. So it's, it's a linear combination of the points xi, <coughs> right? And I, 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 and I need to set it equal to zero, right? To find the optimal condition for the minimum. The gain must be equal to zero. So these are these two I can remove and uh, I <coughs> can rewrite this uh, in this form. I can rewrite it as the sum over i w transpose <coughs> xi uh, right xi equal to sum over i yi xi. Now here it's important to pay attention that this is a number because it's the inner product between w and x. And this is a, is a vector, this is a number, and this is a vector. And this is a vector, it's a vector equation, it's a set of equations, one for each component of my vectors x. But I can also rewrite it in a different way so that it looks like a, a linear system of equations. So this is a linear system of equation that is not written well. The linear system of equation is a variable w. So w is what you want to find to solve these equations. So I can write this as instead of w transpose xi, I can write xi transpose w. Because the inner product is symmetric. It's the same thing if you take the inner product between x and w or w and x. So I use the symmetry. Um, and also, this is a, so, let me do step by step, let me, let me do it very I will not do this all the time, but I think it is useful. So 
this is the first step that I do. So I just work on the left hand side. The right hand side, I don't touch it, it's the same. I write like this. Okay. Yeah, this is a number. Right? This is a vector. I can also interchange that because another vector times, it doesn't matter the order. So I can put the xi there. So I have the sum over i, xi, xi plus plus one right? And then I can uh, pair together xi and xi transpose, right? Because xi is a column vector, xi transpose is a row vector, and I can multiply them together. So this is the same as sum over i, xi, xi transpose. So this is a matrix. <coughs> D times D matrix. So, so then my linear system of equation is that this matrix times W must be equal to this. <coughs> okay. Okay. So what is it? <coughs> In matrix notation, I can rewrite the like this. Some of the i's and i and i is exactly x. Transpose x, right? Where, uh, this. So when I use the notation, mm. that's the same notation. <coughs> of course, x is the matrix whose rows are the data points x i. Yeah, the first index is uh, the first index is the data point, and the second index is the component, which goes from one to the convention. Okay, so this is the matrix x transpose. Data points is the point x stays as well. So this is a necessary equation. Another way to derive it, which is once you know make this calculus is, is quicker, <coughs> is to differentiate uh, this guy, right? Because of the, 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 the residual sum of squares can be written in a more, more compact form, right? As the norm square of a vector y, which is a, uh, uh, is n. So as the n-dimensional vector, so I think it's a revised learning for this n. Never mind. So it's an n-dimensional vector of all the output that you have. X is the matrix, and one of the parameters is divided by that. It's clear to everybody, the notation. So if it's not clear, just stop from here and let the spell on the matrix. Don't be shy. So first, we need to realize that. And then we need to understand how we can differentiate this without doing all these sums and stuff like that that I've done here. So this is very instructive because it's step by step. But we can also do it more quickly by uh, using some matrix calculus. <coughs> so well, let me do it. So, so you just take the gradient of R. R is this thing. So you write R as y minus x w transpose minus y minus x w. You can also write like that. But then uh, you get three terms. That's my way to do The first term is y transpose y with the constant. Then you get W transpose X transpose X W. And then you get minus W transpose X transpose Y. Right. Then we get the other term, which is exactly the same as this. So I put the two here. Actually, uh, let me write it, sorry, let me write it as Y transpose. <coughs> X minus two. So I get these three terms that are obtained by expanding it in a bond. Then the bond between this and this, which is this, between this and this, which is this, which is this, which is this which is plus sign, then it's 
in the product between y <coughs> and x w and x w and y <coughs> are the same because it's a product symmetric. So it gives me this term of minus two sign. Then I can differentiate uh, all these terms. So the first I'm getting it from zero. The second gives me we need to know that the gradient of the quadratic form is just the matrix, the quadratic form, x star cos of x times w times two. And here you get the gradient of this function, so this is an inner product. The gradient of the inner product is just between the variable and the vector is the vector. Right? So this is the inner product between w and minus two uh, x transpose y. The inner product between w and Minus two x plus plus y is equal to zero, and you get exactly that equation which is there. Right? So in general, in general, there are a lot of rules of matrix uh, calculus that <coughs> sometimes are useful to quickly get the answer. You don't, you don't need to know all of it, but it's just some information that I give you if you want to you know, specialize more. So, um, I think it's useful to discuss three more slides before we break. So now we want to understand what type of property of This is a fact that with the 
algebra, so we can just the dimension four for the orthogonal decomposition. And one way to do that is to find what the normal basis for the range space, and then complete that to the basis for the whole space. In this case, you can see that the basis here is on top of the basis here, so that is a unique on top of the composition. There are a lot of factors. So, <coughs> the point here to keep in mind is that the composition is in y computer, y bar, and also what is important is that the norm. <coughs> that the square norm of y is equal to the square norm of y bar plus the square norm of uh, y term. Right? The reason being is that they, they are not talking right? about If you take the square norm of y, is y y transpose, that is equal to this vector times itself transpose, and the cross product is equal to zero, and therefore you get a set. It doesn't make sense. You want to see the steps. 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 So what, what, what I said in words is uh, right, is this equation. Right. This equation follows by the fact that y bar is orthogonal to y term. Right. Y bar. I could also call this a parallel. One is the range space, one is the range space. We are just going to parallel. Okay. So this follows by the fact that right? this is y transpose y. I want to realize that I'm saying that. With all the cross products, you get y this, that times that, then you get the cross products, but these are zero, right? So you get the this, you get this, you get this, you get something that is written there, because the norm, the beta product of the vector we sent is the square norm. Okay, then. Now, what is the point? Okay. The point is that my uh, the C <coughs> of the class, right, which is y minus x factor, can be written like this. This is the important thing to relax. Right? And why is that? Because so y, I write it as the sum of a vector in the edge space and one vector orthogonal to the edge space. Right? So, we replace here y bar uh, plus y term. So that this vector is in the range space by definition, because it's x w is a generic vector in the range space. Because what the range space is, is a set of vectors which are in the combination of the cones. Right? So the composition is still all true. So, right? The y term perpendicular, and then you have the vector in the this vector is in you know, order to this vector by uh, construction. So you can write the objective function as this term, the constant, does not depend on w, plus this one, which is like before, but except the difference, the, the, the only difference is that y is replaced by y bar. function, this function is a sum of some constant, 
point of W plus uh, the function of W plus by C of the previous one. The only difference that I have replaced Y by the projection of Y on the rim space. So, so this is the first observation about the squares that now allows us to reach some conclusions. So the first conclusion is that since <coughs> uh, W should be since here I minimize over W, since these two vectors are in the same space, the minimum it would be zero. But I can always find the vector W such that x W is equal to y bar. Right? Because y bar gives y bar for the constructions and the combination of the columns. The generic in their combination of the columns. So it must be the case that there is a y bar such that that is equal to x bar. So the minimum then of my objective function is just this. It's just the norm of the orthogonal um, So I cannot make my objective function smaller than this. question is, is there a vector which makes the object equal to this? The answer is yes, because what I said before, you can find the vector w such that uh, you make this equal to zero. So the answer is that any vector w which makes this uh, difference equal to zero is a solution. So the least square solutions are not unique in general, and uh, all the vectors W which solves this linear system of equation. So now what we want to understand is when the solution is unique. So, so I propose two more slides and then Because 
a is less than equal to n is equal to b, the space obtained by taking all linear combination of electrons is four. So it's the largest possible, which is n. In this case, you can invert x, this matrix, if x times was x, which was the matrix which defined my normal equations. So about the equation derived by the value of condition of my foundational problem, and then I can find the solution, the unique solution of the problem, which is the least square solution, which I have this form. In particular, if n is equal to d, the solution is just x inverse y. In a way, it is like uh, it is a kind of a standard case. So, so if, if n is, is greater or equal to d, and if my points are kind of in a generic position, so for example, they are sub for IID from some Gaussian distribution, it would be the case that uh, the matrix X is full round. So it would be a unique solution. Although you can find situations. Still, there are two subcases also here to consider. Uh, and typically, the second one is the card. So, going back to our the previous <coughs> slide, we can ask ourselves whether the minimum is equal to zero. In whether it's more than zero. Okay. So, in order to be equal to zero, it must be the case that y is a linear combination of the, of the, of the rows of x. So, of the, sorry, of the, yeah, of, of the columns. Um, otherwise, so this doesn't say anything. So I'm just saying that if uh, y is the red space, then the minimum is zero, and y is So, which means that this, this is the typical case. You cannot go through the data. And the reason is that you have <coughs> less uh, modular points and parameters. You ask too much, you ask, you ask, you ask, you ask too much new functions to go the data. On the other hand, so this is the classical case. On the other hand, what about if now we have more parameters than more unknowns than our equation? So more generally, if you ask what about if the right of x is less, less than d, well, let's consider the case n less than d. In this case, the solution is not unique. And as I called it before. And again, you have two cases. If we have the y, is in the range space of x. <coughs> in this case, you can interpolate the data. And now, this is the case. We have more unknown equations. So, typically, in this case, the solution will not be unique, but all the solution we make, all the least square solution we make, the error zero, and it will be all the interpolate. Still, that could not be the case. Then I'm done uh, with these uh, with cases. Uh, so it could be the case that the vector y is not a linear combination of the columns of x, the range space of x. And this could be kind of a pathological case 
and what, when could that happen? Well, it could happen when you have that the first data point is equal to the second data point. It's kind of a degenerate case. But uh, the corresponding output, right, that you obtain for the first data point is different. Y1 is different from Y2. In this case, you have to Either you go through the pair x1, y1, to the pair y2. But what I'm saying is, is just this. So the first point is x1, y1. And the second point is x2, y2, but x2 is equal to x1. So you have this point. Then you have other points. So I don't know. You may not be able to interpolate the data. You cannot go to both points in the line. Thank you. 